So this is kind of a talk about micro gems, uh, which I didn't come up with. Another smart guy did. Uh, it's a way of putting gems in a gist. Uh, the point being, if you have some tiny little snippet of code, um, you want to do something quick, just throw it out there, get it into your project, share it around. Um, it's kind of low barrier. Uh, what's the easiest thing? Um, but the bigger, the bigger sort of thought process behind the talk is how do we reduce sort of the friction or eliminating the barriers to the stuff that we do or could be doing on a regular basis. Uh, if you want to follow along on the uh, slides, you can grab them off my GitHub page. So they're right there. Uh, if you want to shoot ahead, there's uh, links to the blog post I'm going to talk about, uh, the gem I wrote to kind of support some of this, uh, and some of the other goodies. So go for that. Anybody need that up there longer? So TJH. Micro gems. So like I said, I lied. It's not really a talk about micro gems. It is, but it isn't. Um, it's about re reducing friction in our workflows. Um, so we spend more time doing the work that we want to do. Um, making gems is kind of a pain in the rear end. There's a whole set of files you got to put together. Um, you know, maybe it sucks to go through the hassle of putting a spot on rubygems.org, um, you know, reserving a repo in your project, putting something out publicly or privately. Uh, with a gist, you can make it private if you want. So if you feel like leaving something behind closed doors, you can do that. Um, but I don't like busy work, and I'm slowly getting more towards that. Uh, I switched from TextMate to Vim and use dot files now. So part of the cur uh, culture where we're at is to spend time working on our tools. You know, we can work on our software, and eventually, after a year or two, you think, well, why didn't I solve this problem? So um, takeaways that I want you to have is to be annoyed more often. Um, let things bother you and use that as kind of a guide towards the stuff you want to fix. Um, for a long time I found that uh, I would just kind of go along and just let my tool sort of piss me off or not think about it enough. Um, so I want you to get annoyed more often and let that guide your improvement. And I would like you all to make a gem. Um, gems are not scary. I always thought they were. I've been doing Rails for like two or three years now and I did a gem like a couple weeks ago. That was probably my first gem so that's, that's kind of sad. Gems are actually really easy and you can do it. So this was like my typical workflow. It's like I'm trying to run the marathon and I'm doing warrior dash in the mud. And it's, it, it's slow, but I didn't realize it was slow until I watched some other people. So I thought, all right, I can't do this any longer. <clears throat> this is the point. We want to be using our tools, uh, straighten the path out, make it a nice, uh, happy path. So MicroGems is a blog post and it's in micro print down there. So if you're following on, along on TGH, uh, github.com slash microgems. Um, you can find the link to this blog post. It's really well written. It's good stuff. Um, but the point is he was thinking, what is the least amount of work I'd have to do to throw together a, uh, a gem? And he was working on, I think, a code brawl or code mash, one of these weekend competitions. And they're like, man, I, I've got this little bit of code and I want to stop typing it into each of my models. And so I'll show you that. Um, so it's a great way to share, share code. You can make them private uh, without buying up a GitHub repo or your GitHub account if you don't want to. Um, but there are some drawbacks and some ways around that. <clears throat> so here's the blog post and he talks about how do you get multiple files into a, a gist and actually put a gem into a gist. Uh, gist can have multiple files, they cannot have folders. Uh, you can fork them, you can do revision history, uh, you don't get issues, you don't get pull requests, and we'll talk a little bit about those limitations here in a minute. Um, so the way we used it is this thing called Axis Boolean. <clears throat> So I love how Rails, when I name a field is underscore something and I make it a Boolean, I get a question mark method that will typecast it into a true or false. I like that, but we also put flags sometimes on our models and I want it to act the same way. So I want something like is published, which is really just an instance variable, I want that to have a question mark method and to essentially do bang bang, I want it to convert it into a Boolean. So we thought, great, uh, we'll just write access Boolean. And so I have this is published. It'll give me my <coughs> adder writer so I can assign it. And it gives me my uh, question mark readers. So we found that we were doing this in our classes. And I, doing the warrior dash, kind of slogging through the mud, it was like, well, I'll keep repeating this pattern. And my boss is like, dude, dude stop doing that. Like, why do you keep putting the same pattern? This is not dry. It's the same concept over and over. Let's take time to figure out how to make it better. So this is essentially the guts of that pull request, or excuse me, the, the gist and the gem. This is maybe not the most beautiful code in the world, but uh, it gets the job done. You essentially access Boolean, you pass it a number of variables, 
uh, the names of the fields you want. It's going to give you an adder writer. It's going to make a method that lets you assign and gives you bang bang so you cast it as a boolean and that's it. So there's the gist. Um, check that out later. Uh, bang was the example from this uh, blog post. So he's got a way that uh, if I have, uh, like in this example, I have a title and I have a method that's like permalink the title. So I want to convert the title into a permalink. So I have this method that's going to do that and I want to save it to a particular field. So he shows how to do that. Again, this is not a whole lot of code, but in their example, they're like, well, we're doing this on a regular basis. Let's throw this into a gem. It's very small. Um, don't want to go through all the hassle. So how do we use it in a project, in your bundler? You can point it to a git repo, and the git repo can be a gist. So drawbacks. Um, what we ran into is what do we do with versioning these now? You're pointing just to a git repo, and so it's just going to keep grabbing the most recent version unless we you know, finagle around with what the URL is. Um, conceivably, you could put in a gist, you could just put in a regular repo. So I don't know that micro gems, micro gem maybe being the concept of fewer files and nice little tight gems, they don't necessarily have to go into gist. Um, you know, maybe publishing your, uh, your gems into a repo and not Ruby gems isn't as stable. Maybe you'll get rid of this gist and people use it. So maybe Ruby gems is a little bit better. Um, no forking. Eh kind of no forking, no pull requests, no issues, and just are kind of hard to find. So if you're looking at my uh, GitHub account, you may not see these gists and these gems that I have over there. So I think we're starting to steer maybe away from the gist route, but still going with the concept of micro gems as in just a couple files. So I put together this little uh, gem partly as a learning project for me, as I show you guys what's going on. I'm kind of forgetful and lazy, so I forget what files it takes to do a gem. It's really just a class library and a gem spec file, that's it. And the gem spec can be really tiny, like 10 lines. What's the version, what's the name of it, who are you, and like what files are in it, that's it. So anyways, microcutter was just a little gem. I thought, I wanna just run a command and have it spit out these files for me, and then I can pump it into a gist or pump it into a repo and be done. So using minicutter, that's it. You just, on your command line, a little executable, pass it in a camel case, uh, class name and it spits out four files. Now really it could just spit out two, your library and your gem spec, but you should you should test. So if you don't use our spec, I'm not mad at you. Um, and I thought, you know, a readme is kind of nice if somebody else is going to look at your gem. And I like uh, GitHub's approach where they do readme first development. The idea that you write your readme, how do I want to use this thing before you write the code? So I think that's worth thinking about. So again, the takeaways from this yeah, get them annoyed more often. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be micro gems. Maybe you should work on your dot .files a little bit, tinker around with that. Um, yeah, and your annoyance should, uh, should point you in a direction what things are the most important. It helps you prioritize. And I'd be really excited if there was like 20 new gems this week, just like five lines. You know, there's simple, simple little things that you may use that you could put into a gem and share with somebody. And it's a great way to get code review. You know, you guys might look at my gem and be like, dude, this is terrible. Like, why would you write this? And I would love that feedback. Um, if you guys look at the presentation, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to fork that. Uh, you know, tweak it. Um, you know, the, uh, the gem I wrote, I would love feedback on that stuff. So I hope you guys know Eli's forking it and putting an issue in. I right actually now. am doing that thing. That's awesome. So I, I hope so. Um, and I would love for you guys to help me improve. Part of like open source, you know, putting our code out there so it can get reviewed. I'd love uh, some feedback on this talk. I don't think you want to type that in, so you could go find this talk on GitHub, so tjh.github.com slash microgems. That would be really cool if you would click that link and rate my talk so I can know what to do better next time. So yeah, there's the Jeff uh, microgems talk, a couple of photos from Flickr. And there you go, so make some gems this week, that would be very cool. Questions? What are you guys thinking? Does anyone know the answer to this? Um, if you put in a version number on a Git repo or I guess any kind of repo, does it bisect to find the version in the repo? Um, I think in Bundler you can put a, a, a revision in and it'll check that out. I know the revision, I think you might build your version too. It'll like work it out for you. I think it will. You don't? I think it will, but I think it's very slow. Or it oh, right. requires tags. Get bisect. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I think it only does the tags. Yeah, maybe it might it be. Tags. So, so tag. <coughs> 
I'll just uh, tag your gist. I'm sure that's a thing that can happen. <laughs> that's a, that's a <laughs> every repo, so yeah, in that's theory true. it should work. You just might not get any information about it in their yeah. in their interface. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. Sure.